So I want to keep this uh, quite informal. I have um, I put here a lot of uh, slides uh, uh, about a couple of different topics uh, centered around recurrent computations, but I, I, I really would like this to be more of a conversation. So please uh, stop me. Please interrupt. Uh, and, and if we don't go th through the whole thing, that's, uh, that's perfectly uh, fine. Uh, with Christoph, I'm a very strong believer that we need to share code and data. Uh, he gave a whole spiel about this. I'm not going to repeat that. Uh, every now and then, when you see some of these QR codes, you can uh, check uh, them out. And, and they should link uh, to uh, uh, code and data for uh, what I'm talking about uh, at that time. It's not quite complete. We still have a lot of data with that we, and, and code that we haven't quite shared. And, and it's not as easy as, uh, as, as, as it sounds. But, uh, but, but, but in many cases, uh, that, should, uh, that should work. And if there's anything that you're interested in that, uh, that you cannot quite get access to, please, um, uh, please talk to me afterwards. So I want to uh, start uh, by giving you an example of uh, uh, approximately state-of-the-art uh, uh, image uh, captioning. Uh, some of you may, may be familiar with this uh, Microsoft uh, captioning uh, bot. It doesn't matter which one it is. There are many uh, base, uh, very similar ones. Uh, if you upload a picture such as this one, uh, it says, I think it's a group of people standing in front of the leaning tower of uh, Pisa. So it's, it's quite remarkable. So if you uh, know about the state of the art uh, uh, a decade ago or so, uh, we, we've made a, a, a pretty long uh, way, right? So we can, uh, the, the system can recognize, uh, when, when I say we, I mean the, 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 the field, uh, uh, the, we, we can uh, recognize the, the Tower of Pisa. Uh, and of course, perhaps that's not too surprising. There are probably gazillion pictures uh, of probably almost the exact same Tower of Pisa out there for training. Uh, tourists are not super original. They mostly take um, uh, some very small variations of exactly the same picture. So, so this is probably uh, almost uh, uh, memorizing uh, pixels, perhaps, or memorizing certain features. Uh, but, but the algorithm goes beyond that. It says uh, it can detect that there's a, a group of people. Uh, and that, that, that's, that's quite impressive. These, these people are pretty small. They're, they're probably just a handful of pixels. And the algorithm can detect that, which is, I think, uh, pretty cool. Uh, of course, uh, it, it may be that in the training set also, when you have a, a, a lot of blue, uh, then, then, then there's, uh, that means that, that the picture may be outdoors. And there's, uh, it correlates very strongly with having a group of people. Uh, it also says that the people are standing, which is actually probably true for most of them. Uh, I don't know if the, the algorithm got it, uh, uh, was, was lucky about it, or, or again, whether that's just the statistics of the training set. Uh, now, if we change the picture to this one, uh, I think it's a, it's a person standing in front of the Leaning Tower Pisa. So again, it, it recognizes Tower Pisa. That's quite impressive. Uh, the, the person is probably, there is a person there. It's probably standing. Uh, uh, yet, uh, I think it's pretty clear that the algorithm misses uh, uh, the most important aspects of, of what's going on here. So I, I, I would contend that. We have a very, very long way to go. So for all the people who say that we've solved vision, that computer vision is solved, I, I, I think we have a, a very, very long way to go until we can build algorithms that will understand uh, a picture like this. Uh, and if you scramble the picture and you should just do a simple game uh, like, like this one, the algorithm says, I think it's a person standing in front of a building. So now if, if this is a very simple transformation. You, it, the algorithm already lost the notion of the, uh, of, of the Tower of Pisa. Uh, it's still got the idea that there are people in there. Uh, but the, again, the, the, ca the caption is, is pretty similar, although the, the picture is uh, completely different in all, all sorts of ways. So the, the, the goal, ultimately, what we'd like to be able to do is uh, uh, take any picture and be able to understand uh, what's happening uh, in that picture, meaning that we want to be able to understand and answer uh, what's uh, effectively an infinite number of uh, questions about the picture. We want to understand uh, what is there, uh, where is Obama's food, uh, we want to be able to, uh, I can ask you, search for all the mirrors in the picture, uh, and so on and so forth, right? So, so here are, are, are just a few of the, uh, of, the, of the example questions that one may be interested in. And, and in particular, as I will argue very shortly, we not only want to be able to do this, but we want to do it in a way that uh, mimics uh, biological processing. That is, we want to understand where are the mechanisms that allow us to answer these questions based on, uh, on, on your own uh, uh, hardware. Okay, uh, so incidentally, uh, 
you may understand from this uh, particular picture uh, that this picture is a little bit uh, funny. Obama is being playful. He's uh, uh, sort of um, uh, playing a joke on this, uh, on, on this guy here. Uh, and I, I, I think I, I cannot even begin to imagine what kind of computational algorithms we need to be able to understand and, and grasp that type of uh, concept. Uh, you need to be able to understand that that white thing there is a scale. Uh, maybe several of you are very young. You have never seen a scale like that. Uh, you need to understand that people are self-conscious about their weight. You need to understand that, that he doesn't know that Obama is doing that. You need to understand that all the other people do uh, know what's going on, and, and, and that's why they're laughing. There, there's so much to, to understanding a scene than, uh, uh, than, than where we are. Uh, and I think that's, that's, that's where we'd like to uh, navigate towards. And the way to do that for us, I, uh, I'm, I'm a physicist by training. I, I like to think about building models and breaking models. Nothing more sophisticated than that. That's what we've been doing for, uh, for, for centuries. Uh, and and, and that, that's, that's part of the goal. We want to build computational models. We want to, these computational models to, to be uh, uh, related to, to biological hardware. And I'll say a few more words about that. And Jim will have uh, uh, a, a lot to say about that, I'm sure. And then we would we'll, we'll like to break those models uh, in order to be able to build uh, uh, better models. So this is our, uh, our trick, the trick that scientists invented. Um, we could perhaps argue that Galileo invented this. This is the, the trick that we invented to be able to have a job forever. So as you can see, we can build models, we can break them, and, and we can continue this loop uh, uh, in, in, in a, and, and have fun for a very long time. Okay. So uh, a couple of uh, the desiderata and basic assumptions for the kind of models that we want to, uh, we want to build. So, uh, just uh, this is uh, basic science. Uh, we want models to be falsifiable. Okay, so we don't want to be able to. Uh, we, we, we don't believe in models where we postulate that there is a, a homunculus in the brain, or uh, or there is a, a, an Obama engine in the brain. So we don't like engines. We don't like uh, homunculus. We, we we need to be able to instantiate models in real in the language of uh, real uh, biological uh, hardware. We want to be able to have quantitative predictions. Uh, we want models that are image computable. There's a lot of exciting work that has happened in the field of vision uh, with models that you cannot do computations directly on the images. So we think that this is uh, an essential ingredient. Uh, we think that the models have to be based on neural networks. We need to respect the basic, uh, some sort of basic mapping uh, of the model onto something that could be implemented by biological hardware. And that, that restricts our space of possible models uh, uh, quite, uh, uh, quite, quite a lot. And we want to be able to explain uh, uh, neuronal responses. We need to be able to explain what happens uh, uh, in the brain. And there are lots of assumptions that we can unpack about this. Uh, at the same time, we would like to be able to capture the behavior of the organism as a whole. We don't think that any of either of these by itself is sufficient. I would not be satisfied purely by explaining behavior without the neurons. I would not be able to. Uh, I would not be satisfied by purely explaining neuronal activity without uh, the behavior. And critically for me, we want to be able to extrapolate to novel situations. So to ensure that whatever uh, whatever model we have, it doesn't only apply to. Uh, just the, the 10 types of pictures that I chose to use for my particular experiment, I want to be able to use uh, this model for any possible picture uh, in, the, in the world. So here's a, a, a very uh, naive uh, initial working hypothesis of some types of uh, 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 computations that we sometimes refer to as visual routines that we think might be important uh, to be able to uh, do visual scene understanding. The idea of a visual routine was coined by, uh, by Shimon Ullman. Uh, who's uh, part of CBMN, but that's not uh, going to give a talk this, uh, uh, this year. But I think you can see some of his videos on, on, online. And the idea is that there are certain computations that, uh, that, that solve specific smaller parts of, uh, of the problem that can be used in a flexible manner, in an interchangeable manner, and in a uh, recurrent and repeatable, uh, uh, in a repeatable fashion uh, 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 as well. So one routine could be to extract an initial sensory map followed by proposing some sort of gist of the image, some sort of basic understanding of the, ba of the, of the property of the image, uh, followed by extracting uh, and perhaps labeling specific objects in, in the foveal region, in, this, in the central part of, the, uh, uh, of where uh, the subject is fixating. Being able to make, uh, to put together this gist of the image with the foveal information to make inferences uh, about uh, what's happening uh, uh, in the picture. Uh, and then be able to sample the picture, perhaps by moving your eyes to sample different parts of the picture. And that's what we refer to as task-dependent sampling and active sampling. 
uh, followed by potentially many other routines, like um, uh, depending on the question, depending on the task, detecting people, detecting spatial relationships, and so on. So this is not an exhaustive list of uh, visual routines, nor am I claiming that this is necessarily correct. This is just a working hypothesis of certain operations that we think would be interesting and important uh, to implement in order to ultimately be able to understand uh, uh, visual uh, scenes. And the idea is that many of these things could be studied uh, uh, somewhat independently, and then we can uh, plug and play and, 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 and combine them uh, to be able to uh, uh, do, uh, uh, solve complex visual tasks in terms of scene understanding. So I'm going to give you a, an example of a few of these, uh, and, and again, when I get uh, more into the meat of some of these uh, uh, specific uh, uh, routines and specific computations, I, I want to encourage people to, um, to stop and interrupt and ask questions, okay? Uh, each one of these uh, routines can in turn be subdivided into multiple subroutines. Perhaps the one of the ones that we understand the best is this idea of uh, how to propose a foveal object, what happens along the ventral visual stream. And I'm, I'm not going to say a lot about this. I'm going to give a brief introduction because Jim is going to say much more uh, about this uh, uh, very, very soon. Uh, usually we do this the other way around, which I think probably makes more sense with Jim describing all of this uh, before I go into uh, talking about uh, recurrent computation. So I'll say a few words about, uh, about, about, this, uh, uh, about this part, but most of this will be explained uh, much better and in much more detail in the, next, uh, in the next talk. So a lot of the inspiration for us to build uh, uh, computational models of uh, visual processing comes from uh, uh, understanding the basic uh, anatomical circuitry of connectivity uh, in the macaque uh, monkey. So what you see this, and, and I think Christoph showed and flashed a version of this diagram uh, during one of his talks as well. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, what you're seeing here is uh, what I call a mesoscopic map of connectivity uh, in, the, in the macaque monkey visual cortex. Each one of these boxes uh, uh, is, is meant to represent a, a visual area. At the bottom, you have the retinal ganglion cells. The next step is a uh, part of the thalamus called the lateral geniculate nucleus. Information from there goes on to the next stage, which is called primary visual cortex, and so on. These uh, lines uh, indicate the connectivity between one of these boxes and, and the other. And as was alluded already in, in, in the talks that, that, that Christoph uh, gave, this is just a, a very, very coarse approximation to the actual connectivity in the, in, in the system. In a few days, we'll have uh, a talk by Jeff Lichtman, who's going to describe at the ultrastructural level, uh, at the EM level, uh, the connectivity between different neurons in a small patch of, uh, of, 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 of the brain. Uh, so if you open each one of these boxes, you'll have a, a bewildering and amazing complexity of, of, of connectivity, of motifs, uh, and, 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 and so on. So this is, this is just a very, very coarse approximation to the way that, that neurons are connected in the, uh, in the in, in the visual uh, system. But even, even at this very coarse and, 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 and mesoscopic level, we see that, uh, that, that, that there's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of complexity. And, and I will contend that uh, the kind of models that we have today only capture a very small fraction uh, of what's, even, uh, what's happening. And this is only looking at, at the visual system uh, 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 alone, uh, without even considering uh, all the other parts of the brain. Uh, why do I look, uh, wh wh where are we uh, inspired by and why are we looking at the macaque? Uh, one of the difficulties is that we just don't have a diagram like this for humans. In humans, we just don't know, uh, uh, basically we know almost nothing about uh, real connectivity uh, in, in the brain. There are a lot of people who make uh, indirect measurements uh, in, in, in humans. And as, as Christoph alluded to, uh, these indirect measurements uh, well, how can I put it? Uh, they, 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 they're, they're difficult to interpret, and, and they, they don't have uh, the, the rigor of being able to trace individual axons to know that one particular part of the brain is connected with, uh, with another. We just don't know, basically, how different parts of the human brain are connected with, uh, with each other. So just to give you a quick glimpse, uh, the, you had already a tutorial about computer vision. Uh, both uh, Jim as well as Tommy will talk more about uh, some of these uh, deep convolutional network models. Many of you are familiar with them. So these uh, diagrams here correspond to AlexNet, VGG. These are names for uh, several deep convolutional neural networks. Deep because they have multiple stages. Convolutional because of the main operation that's repeated over and over over the space of the uh, uh, of, of the picture. And these are net 
networks that have been extremely successful in visual object recognition uh, tasks. So in a typical visual object recognition task, and I know that some of you are quite familiar with these type of uh, problems, but just for those of you who are not, uh, you have a, a lot of pictures. Let's say they belong to uh, uh, the certain number of categories. For example, there's one database that's called ImageNet. There are a thousand different categories. Uh, and you can train these algorithms to put labels onto these pictures. This is a chair, this is a table, and so on. And, and, and people then, uh, you, you do cross-validation, you take other pictures, and you do try to put labels, and you evaluate how well you can label uh, the, the test images uh, after training, uh, training the system. So these are the essentially uh, several different systems that, that, that achieve uh, pretty high performance in this uh, type of tasks. To some extent, and again, this will, uh, we'll discuss this in more depth uh, with, with Jim's talk, uh, the, the black boxes, uh, the, the, the boxes that are circled uh, um, in, in black on the, on, the, uh, on the left there are the ones that are uh, purportedly to, uh, to be described by this type of model. So it's only a very small fraction of what's happening in the visual system that's being incorporated into this uh, type of uh, computational uh, models. So how do we know what happens in one of these boxes? How do we know what a neuron in the retina uh, uh, does? How do we know what a neuron in LGN, in V1 does, and so on? So the gold standard to be able to understand function is to look at the spiking activity of uh, neurons in the brain. So there, there have been heroic efforts uh, by many people over uh, the last uh, approximately uh, uh, seven decades uh, putting electrodes in different parts of the brain and trying to map the responses to different types of uh, images. So just to give a, a quick overview and a very unfair overview of seven decades of visual neurophysiology, uh, Stephen Kuffler uh, recorded the activity of retinal ganglion cells and showed that neurons in the retina are particularly picky about the location of uh, uh, illumination in the, in, in, in the visual field. That's what. Uh, um, uh, following, up, following up on, uh, on earlier works, he defined the, the receptive field of neurons in the, in, the, in, in the retina, showing that neurons are, are interested in a particular location in the visual field and not in others. Fast forward uh, uh, a few years, and we have Hublin Wiesel showing that in primary visual cortex, neurons are tuned to bars of a particular orientation. A neuron may fire very strongly uh, to a vertical bar and almost not at all to a horizontal uh, bar. People have divided the visual system into two main streams, the, the parietal or dorsal uh, stream, where we find neurons that are uh, particularly selective to uh, uh, aspects of the visual stimulus, such as uh, a stereo uh, or, or, or the direction of motion. Uh, and then the temporal uh, uh, pathway or the ventral pathway, which is going to be the main focus of the next talk, uh, where uh, uh, we can find uh, neurons that are selective to uh, complex shapes, uh, including fractals, including paper clips, uh, including faces, including chairs, and, 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 and many other uh, types, of, um, uh, types of shapes. So just as a quick uh, uh, description, uh, what do we know about the human visual system? Uh, again, almost nothing. It's very hard to record the spiking activity of neurons in the human brain. Uh, every now and then, we can record intracranial field potentials. And I'll show you a couple of examples of field potentials along the hum in, in the human brain. And in a couple of very uh, 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 limited cases, we have access to spiking activity in the human brain by working with patients that have uh, uh, ep refractory epilepsy. Uh, so uh, at the top of this uh, uh, diagram, the pinnacle of this diagram is actually the hippocampus uh, and the dendrinal cortex, ER, and the hippocampus, HC. These are strictly not purely visual areas. If you make a lesion in the hippocampus, uh, uh, humans can still see very well. Nonetheless, this is one of the areas that we had access to. So if you put electrodes in the human uh, medial temporal lobe in areas like the hippocampus, dendrinal cortex, and, and the amygdala, you can also elicit visually selective uh, responses. This is an example from a uh, very old work that uh, we did with uh, our colleagues Itzhak Fried and, 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 and Christoph Koch. Uh, in this case, this is an example of uh, a neuron. Uh, in this particular case, this is a neuron that was located in the right amygdala of this uh, patient. Each one of those dots corresponds to one spike. Uh, and uh, this is a, a typical raster plot where you see the, uh, the, the responses in every single trial in response to that particular picture. And the histograms below the raster plots correspond to the posthumous time histogram. That is the average activity over trials of that particular neuron uh, to that particular picture. So this is a single neuron, uh, and I'm 
showing you here the responses to 15 different pictures. So you see, you see that this neuron was, uh, was very picky. It didn't just respond to any picture. It responded to some pictures, in this particular case, to three different pictures of uh, uh, former president uh, uh, Bill Clinton. It did not respond to other faces. It did not respond to other presidents. It did not respond to other uh, pictures of chairs, animals, and, and so on. So it was highly selected. So some people started calling these uh, Bill Clinton neurons or Jennifer Aniston neurons in the same way that people uh, talk about uh, orientation to neurons uh, or, or face neurons or chair neurons and, and, and so on. So I want to start by, by, by following up on, on, on what um, uh, on some of the discussion that Christoph uh, elicited by asking how well do we really understand uh, cortical uh, responses? So, and in other words, what do neurons really uh, want? How do we know that at, out of all the possible stimuli in the world, uh, the ones that we happen to have chosen to, uh, um, for, for, for the experiment are really meaningful in any sort of uh, way? So just to clarify, when we say what do, uh, uh, what do visual neurons really want, of course neurons do not want anything. Neurons are in the business of uh, communicating with other neurons. Uh, they fire action potentials depending on the inputs. And to a first approximation, if the sum of all the inputs uh, is uh, strong enough, uh, there's a particular part of the neuron that uh, essentially will dictate whether an action potential will be fired uh, or not. So the sense in which I, uh, I ask the question, what do neurons really want, is how can we uh, effectively drive a neuron? How can we maximize the firing rate of a neuron, the activation of a neuron? Uh, by carefully selecting what kind of pictures uh, we use. Is it true that neurons are interested in chairs? Is it true that neurons are interested in, in orientation or, or Bill Clinton? Or what are the kinds of visual stimuli that will maximally drive uh, neurons? I'm going to restrict this question to the domain of flash stimulus presentations, and in this case uh, to, to, to passive viewing, and importantly to realistic uh, experimental conditions where we have a finite amount of time to entertain ourselves uh, with, uh, with the neuron. The final amount of time is critical because of the curse of dimensionality. Essentially, it's, uh, with current techniques, it's impossible to exhaustively sample uh, the uh, stimulus space. Okay? So if you consider an image that has 100 by 100 pixels, uh, arguably a very small patch of the visual field, but nonetheless, 100 by 100 pixels, each pixel can have 256 uh, shades of grays. And you want to, uh, you want to exhaustively explore uh, stimulus space. Uh, I think I did a calculation that uh, it, um, if you show five pictures per second continuously in five years, one could present about 10 to the 9 uh, pictures. Uh, and it would take uh, uh, a couple of uh, 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 millennia uh, for a grad student that never sleeps and never eats to be able to show all of those possible uh, pictures. So it's just impossible to test all possible um, pictures. So what, what do people do? Um, so people are uh, inspired by previous studies. So somebody else published a paper saying that gratings are uh, effective at driving V1, so let's try gratings. And though that, that has been extremely uh, successful. Lots of heroic experiments trying uh, uh, responses to gratings uh, all, all throughout the visual system. Uh, a lot of people have intuitions about certain images that uh, may be more interesting than others. For example, some people believe that faces are cute and interesting, and, and therefore we should study them as a, as a special category uh, because they may be uh, uh, of some sort of uh, evolutionary uh, uh, relevance. Uh, so th th this is uh, basically choosing stimuli based on in intuitions about what kind of pictures are important. Uh, other people have argued that the statistics of natural images are relevant to dictate what kind of images we want. That, that in, our visual systems were trained in, a, in, a, in an environment that has certain regularities, and we can use those regularities to guide uh, okay. what kind of pictures we use. Then people have used computational models. And perhaps one of the most fundamental ways of discovering uh, the tuning properties of neurons along the ventral visual cortex has always been serendipity, people getting lucky. Uh, and um, if people are interested, we can discuss about uh, three examples here of how people uh, got lucky, essentially. Uh, um, so it's a combination of careful observation uh, and, and a lot of hard work uh, uh, and, and, and getting lucky and being at the right place at the right time uh, to discover uh, uh, what, what neurons may be interested in. So uh, I want to briefly talk about uh, a study that was conducted by uh, uh, a student, uh, Will, Will Xiao in the lab, uh, to try to come up with a 
unbiased or at least less biased way uh, of exploring the tuning properties of neurons, uh, of visual neurons in, in monkeys, in humans, in, 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 in whatever species uh, you, you want. So the basic idea is that uh, we're going to try to get the neuron it's to dictate what, uh, what, what it prefers, what it, what, what it likes. So the algorithm goes like this. We have uh, on the top left here, uh, we have an image generator. So this is uh, an algorithm that will generate uh, pictures. Uh, if you think about deep convolutional networks, basically what happens in a deep convolutional network is that at the beginning, at the, at the input, uh, you have uh, an image, you have pixels, and then you extract some features. This image generator turns the problem upside down, basically. So we, we start with features, and the output of that is an image. So the output of this generator is a picture. So then we're going to record the activity of, the, uh, of, of a neuron in response to that picture. And then we're going to use some sort of uh, search algorithm, for example, a genetic algorithm, to try to get the neuron itself to evolve and dictate what kind of pictures uh, it likes. So this is done in real time in a, in a, in a closed close loop to try to uh, evolve pictures that will maximize some sort of function uh, that's dictated by the neuron. In the examples that I'm going to describe now, uh, we're going to use the firing rate of the neuron as the main function that we're trying to optimize. So we want to maximize the number of spikes, the spike count, uh, in, in a given window. Uh, this, is, uh, this is an assumption. We choose firing rates because lots of people in the field have been using firing rates forever. Uh, but in principle, you could optimize other things. You could optimize local field potentials. You could optimize uh, the derivative of the firing rate. You could optimize the synchrony between neurons. You could choose your favorite function, your favorite intuitions about the neural code, and try to optimize that. Here, we're going to work mostly with spike counts. I see several questions. Uh, uh, I think Lucy and then uh, Niels. Yeah. That's, that's a good question. So we, we, we don't. Uh, I will show you that in a couple of cases, we got lucky. And, and, and there seem to be a monotonic conversions. And uh, I think it's pretty reasonable to, to observe that empirically uh, this converged. Uh, ultimately, we don't know where to stop. Uh, we can talk about local uh, maxima in firing rate or not. I think these are interesting questions. I'm happy to discuss those later. But we, we don't. And we just have some sort of criterion for convergence. Uh, I'm yes. Curious, uh, how are the parameters of the generative network itself uh, changed? Is that as like a general can on image network? Very, very, very good. Um, I'm going to show you some computational exercises where we play with that and we, 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 we try different uh, possibilities uh, for that. Uh, I'm also going to show you some uh, uh, monkey neurophysiology experiments that we've done in collaboration with March Livingstone. Uh, uh, and in that case, we used a fixed uh, uh, system, which was essentially inversion of AlexNet. Uh, we started with FC6. So this was a pre-trained, uh, uh, so for those of you who are aficionados in the field, AlexNet is uh, in an eight-layer uh, neural network. It was pre-trained on ImageNet. This is this large large data set I was uh, uh, referring to uh, earlier. And so this was pre-trained on, on, on ImageNet, and this is an inverted version of, of that. In computationally, we played with many other different generators, and, and I can show you results. With monkeys, unfortunately, this is very costly, very expensive. We, we, we had to make some choices, and that's one of our choices. Uh, Cole. Yeah, I have a question about the full setup, the way you set it up. Um, so I was thinking, like, imagine I walk into a boardroom, a board meeting, and there are multiple people who are sitting there and talking a language that I don't understand. But I'm seeing them producing sound and modulating their sound and producing words in some language. It seems to me like this approach is comparable to that. So you have neurons that are talking, they have some role in this function that they're producing. And I have access to their firing rate, this is like the analogy of the sound. And the way I want to make sense of what role each board member is playing is by making them shout the loudest. I think that's a very good question. And we can, uh, so, so what, the basically we're asking, why, why are we trying to maximize firing rate? Why, why not something else, right? No, no, so, no, no, no. Uh, right, so let, let, let me ask the question a different way. Hubel and Wiesel got a Nobel Prize for discovering orientation tuning. Uh, what, what is orientation tuning in, 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 in V1? It means that there are more spikes for one orientation than another, right? So there's an implicit assumption there that more spikes is, is a good thing, right? Uh, what, what is a place cell in the hippocampus? A place cell in the hippocampus is a cell that fires more in one location than another. And I can go on and on and on. So it, it's true. I, 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 it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an empirical question. Do firing rates matter? Does anyone listen to those firing rates? Does more firing rate have, uh, have any, uh, has any correlation with behavior? Th these are very good questions. Uh, I, I think I'm, 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 I'm 
uh, together with 99% of systems in our science over the last five decades in, in using firing rates. But you're absolutely right. In, uh, we, uh, in principle, this, this, uh, the this general formulation of the approach is agnostic to what you're trying to maximize. So if you have a better metric, so you could tell me that I know for sure that uh, uh, what really is relevant is uh, the joint mutual information uh, between uh, these 200 uh, and 50 neurons. And we can try to maximize that using the same uh, algorithm. We started with firing rates because, again, that's, that's a simple thing to start with. But, but you're right. I, I, I don't disagree with that. Uh, yeah. uh, yes? Um, do you think there will be a difference when uh, the, the neurons in a functional, functioning regime versus I'm just pushing it to the limit? So for example, if the animal is doing some task while you're doing is it because I guess the most extreme example I'm thinking about is if you do a liver reporting and you have some profile of what that cell might be better looking like, and you do slice recordings, I can inject some kind of current that just burns the cells to like crazy, but I don't see the cell behaving like that in that, that, that's a very good point as well. Uh, again, we, we had to start somewhere, and we chose to start uh, by looking at the condition of passive viewing and flashing pictures. This is certainly not the only thing that I want to understand in vision. I like to understand everything. Uh, what have, what's the, does it depend on the temporal history? Does it depend on whether the monkey is scratching his head? Does it depend on whether the monkey is doing a visual discrimination task? These are very valid questions. Uh, in, in this case, uh, we, we, we started with, 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 with the most basic uh, passive viewing condition, flashing pictures, and trying to maximize firing rates. So, and we think this is a useful and interesting regime, but, but I'm not claiming that that this will extrapolate to every possible condition. Maybe if we show videos, we'll, we'll get a different uh, uh, answer, for example. And uh, uh, we're very slow. We're going very, very slowly. And, uh, uh, yes. that's also yeah, and, uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, I don't know who's first. Yeah, go ahead. Let, let, let me, I, 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 haven't, I, I guess uh, you're all very smart. You assume that this worked. That's why I'm showing it. I, I haven't shown you anything yet. So hold on to this question. And, 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 and if, it's still, if it's still unclear at the end, let, let, uh, ask me again. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, think I was going to ask how you just said uh, how you enter the neurons that are firing the neurons get tired and stop firing. Like, the, where the neurons get tired? And tired, tired. Yes, but that's a very good point. So. Uh, uh, I'll say a few words about that as well. So let, let me uh, show a little bit of uh, results, and then uh, th that's a very important question as well. Uh, is there anything unclear about the, the role of the methodology? Or okay, so let me let me start quickly by so okay. So the first step, uh, we have an image generator. This is essentially uh, an inversion of AlexNet uh, here. This is the the, the reference. Uh, we start with completely random conditions. We chose 36 uh, random uh, uh, images, so we start with, uh, with with noise. And to start and and, and, and assess whether this might uh, even work or not, uh, instead of a, a, a human or instead of a monkey there, we put a computational model. So we take a, a network here, uh, and we're going to study that, uh, that network. For example, we're going to study AlexNet or ResNet. Uh, this is very different from that network. Okay, so here we're using uh, a computational model uh, as a proxy, as a species, as a, as, as, as a cat, as a monkey, as a human. We're going to record the activity of a unit in the network just to say whether we can actually maximize activation in that network. This is a useful exercise for us to, to even know whether it works. If it works here, it doesn't mean that it will work in vivo. Uh, but if it doesn't work here, then we would be uh, in trouble. So the short answer is that it does work in here. Yes. So the network is OK, you don't get the identity because in this network, we're assuming we're making no assumptions about what we know. So, so we're, we're treating this as a black box. Uh, so we're, we're making no assumptions that we know anything about this particular network. But you may be worried about the fact that if this works, does it work because I'm using exactly the same network, right? And I'm going to show you that that's not the case, OK? But, but that, that, that's, that's, that's a, uh, a good concern to have. Are, are we all just overfitting here, OK? But we're going to treat this as a black box, OK? I'm going to assume absolutely no knowledge. I, don't, I know nothing about the number of layers in that network, uh, about the weights, OK? Uh, all right. Um, OK, so we, we put our electrode in the, in the network. We look at the activation of one of these units. 
uh, and this is one example. So this is the, uh, uh, the top layer of uh, AlexNet, uh, a layer called FC8. Uh, this is uh, unit 599. It's called the Honeycomb uh, unit because it's particularly, uh, it's, it's involved in uh, recognizing uh, Honeycomb. So if you look at the 1.4 million pictures in, in, in ImageNet, uh, the three best pictures uh, are those three pictures, and that's the activation value that you get in response to those pictures for that, uh, for that, uh, for that particular uh, unit. So if you look at the distribution of activation values uh, for all the image net uh, images, that's the, the green curve there. That's a distribution of activation values for, for all possible images. And then we run our uh, evolution algorithm. We create images trying to maximize activation. And lo and behold, we can maximize uh, activation. We can get images that will drive this unit uh, much, much better than the best possible images in, in, in ImageNet. Uh, so that, that, that's what we're showing here with all of those uh, gray bars. The, the shade of gray here indicates uh, which generation we're talking about. At the beginning, we start randomly, so we have m images that are very bad, meaning they trigger very low activation values. At the end, we, ca we have very high activation values. So at the end, we have this, uh, this picture over there uh, that gives you an activation of 37.6, which is uh, much better than these 1.4 million images in ImageNet. Okay? Uh, we call this uh, super stimuli, images that elicit higher activation than, 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 than classical ones. Okay? So we can do this again and again and again. So here we did that for uh, 100 different units in different uh, layers. This works in, uh, in different layers. Uh, there, there was a, an important question before, does it only work on, if you try it on AlexNet because the generator is from, Alex, uh, 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 is from AlexNet? We can try this on, on lots of other architectures. Again, remember the generator is fixed. That's based on, on AlexNet. But now we're looking at units in Inception, in ResNet, in all kinds of other uh, uh, networks. Uh, we are, again, we're making no assumption about any of the ways. We know nothing about those. those we're treating those as black boxes. We can still drive. We can still find uh, images that will drive uh, those units uh, better than the best pictures in ImageNet most of the time, not all of the time. So everything that's below one uh, means that we fail to find something that's better than pictures in, in, in ImageNet. There's, there may still be very uh, good pictures, but not better than ones in ImageNet. Yes? If you look at the best images, do you find let, 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 me, let me come back to that. So, uh, w one of the arguments I'd like to make is that uh, we should avoid trying to find patterns in terms of words, uh, in terms of describing pictures. Uh, so um, what, I, what I'd like to argue is that units are interested in describing and, and extracting certain types of features that we cannot necessarily put into words. So, so I showed you one example of, the, of that image. So that, that one over there is the image. And if you want, you can probably start to make claims about that kind of looks like a honeycomb ish to me, or it has a lot of yellow, or it has, we can use those words to describe it. I, I'd rather not. I'd rather avoid uh, any, any kind of description of what that is. All I can say is that that's a picture that can uh, trigger high activation. Yeah. What I mean is, um, you look at, say, 100 messages, and you find that there are well, so, so here, here we have 100 different units, so I don't necessarily expect them to be similar. These are different uh, units in the network. Uh, one unit likes chairs, one unit likes cars, one unit likes uh, honeycombs. So, so here I'm showing a distribution over different units. But if you do that for the same unit, and you have different initial conditions, and I think I'm not going to show that here, then I think your question uh, uh, is, 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 is more relevant, that is, can I, if, if I start with different initial conditions, do I always converge into the same thing? The answer is no. Do I converge into similar things? The answer is yes. Do I converge into similar activation values? The answer is yes. But those things are not identical. And that's an important question that we don't have a good grasp on that, that we can discuss further. OK, uh, I want to accelerate here. So now we felt confident that this method works. Uh, we, uh, collaborated with, uh, with March uh, Livingstone. Incidentally, she's going to come and give a talk in a, in a couple of days as well. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about doing exactly the same thing, but looking at the activity of uh, uh, neurons in, in, in macaque monkeys. So this is a typical recording from uh, a neuron in inferior temporal cortex, specifically in one of these areas that March and many others uh, call a face patch. What's it, what is a face patch? Uh, it's a particular part of cortex that uh, using non-invasive functional neuroimaging uh, seems to have higher activity for pictures of faces compared to other types of, uh, uh, of stimuli. 
And lo and behold, if you present uh, lots of different natural pictures, these are examples of the types of pictures that they have been using, and you measure the response, the firing rate uh, in response to objects, you get a very low activation. The uh, uh, response to monkey faces and human faces is much higher. So based on this kind of response, uh, a lot of people would like to call this particular type of cell a face cell. What does it mean uh, to be a face cell? It means that, that you, get a bit, uh, you, you get more spikes in response to some of these human and monkey faces compared to some of these other arbitrary categories that were used uh, for uh, comparison purposes. If you look at the top 10 pictures, they're shown here. The worst 10 pictures are shown there. This is what uh, in the field has been called uh, a phase uh, selective uh, response. So we run our synthetic uh, generation algorithm, our evolution uh, algorithm, and, and, and this is what we get. So here I'm showing the response, the firing rate of the neuron, as a function of the generation uh, number. So I'd like to uh, make a couple of points, uh, partly in response to previous uh, questions. So the natural pictures are the real world pictures. Those are the chairs and faces and monkeys and, and, and so on. You see that the response to those pictures uh, decreases a little bit of, of, over time. Uh, that's a small effect. And we think that that has to do with adaptation, with the fact that we're repeating the same pictures over and over again. There's also adaptation to the, to the evolved uh, pictures, which end up looking very similar to each other after many generations. So we're fighting against that type of adaptation. We think we, think we have some sort of quantitative grasp on adaptation by looking at these gray, gray curves. The firing rate to the synthetic images increases over time, almost by definition. That's basically saying that our method is working. And we don't have a good stopping time. We, we stop at some point where we think that there's convergence based on, the, uh, uh, on putting a threshold on how much change there is in the firing rate uh, from one generation to the next. This is a standard cri stopping criteria in many, uh, in, in, in many uh, ways in which people train neural networks as well. Uh, uh, but, but we don't know that that's the final point in any sense of final, right? It's conceivable that if we were to record from this same neuron for five years, uh, there could be another picture that will trigger 200 spikes per second, uh, and, and we just didn't see that. And, and, and we can discuss that as well. Um, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how you'd quantify that here. So the, the natural pictures and the synthetic ones are, are, are intermixed. Uh, the monkeys are uh, fixating in this case. Uh, the natural pictures uh, may show some sort of advantage in here because there are fewer of the. These are all different. They're not like the same picture. Right. So I, I don't know how you quantify surprise. So one, one version of surprise is uh, you're, you're seeing all, all these uh, funny evolved images, and all of a sudden you see a chair. So to the extent that you think that that's surprising, uh, that, 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 that would be included in this. Um, but maybe you have another definition of surprising. But OK. Uh, all right. So, so this, is, this is what we get. We, get, uh, we, we can uh, generate images that are better, uh, that is in the sense of eliciting higher firing rates than, uh, than natural pictures. Here's one example of, uh, of that process. We start in generation 0 in the upper left. Uh, we go through this uh, uh, whole procedure. At the end of 209 generations, we get that picture. And somebody may ask you, well, what, what is that picture? I don't know what that picture is. Uh, I personally uh, would like to refrain from putting a word onto what that picture is. A lot of people disagree with me. I think March disagrees with me. I think this will be fun to ask her. And, and he'll, she'll have a, a whole conversation about this. Uh, I see this as uh, a combination of features that are effective in uh, eliciting high firing rates. And that's nothing more, nothing less. Uh, here are two more examples. Uh, in green, I'm showing the distribution of firing rate responses uh, after background subtraction. That's why you can get negative firing rates here. Uh, uh, in response to 2,550 uh, uh, natural images, and uh, in, in gray, you can see the, the responses to the, uh, to the images that we, uh, that we evolved. Okay, so, so here are two examples. The one on the, on the right, well, we did not manage to uh, uh, get a picture that was better than all the 2,550. We got something that was very close in terms of uh, firing rates, uh, but not necessarily better in this case. Adam. Uh, just a question about the experimental setting. Uh, do you do eye tracking? Do you so the, the monkeys are fixating. So this is doing passive fixation. There's no behavior. It's passive fixation. They're, all they have to do is fixate in this case. Yeah. And uh, when I see the synthetic images, it seems that the high frequency comments are missing. Uh, is there any regularization happening inside? Uh, uh, say it again. So when I see the early, early and late synthetic images, yes. it's, it's more, more likely like only the low frequency comments are there. There is no high frequency per se. 
or in the, in the images themselves. Uh, I, I, I think you're right. I think you're right. We, we are not selecting for high frequency or, or, or high spatial frequencies in the images. Uh, but the algorithm, in principle, can evolve to, to wherever, whatever it is. Uh, 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 but, but, but I think you're right. I think, I think the, 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 the early synthetic ones, the, the, they, are, they are noise, but the way we synthesize that noise based on, we, we use something called the Portilla Simoncelli algorithm. And, and, and it may be right that, that, that we start with lower, uh, that, that overall they have lower frequency content. Uh, so we're not trying to optimize uh, uh, frequency or color or contrast or chairness or faceness. Uh, we, we're letting the algorithm decide uh, wh wh where it goes. Uh, just w the only goal here is to maximize firing rates. Yeah, I, I don't have a, a good picture of this here. Uh, um, uh, the, the, these recordings were done with a, with a Utah array. Uh, nearby cells were correlated in their firing preferences, but they were not identical. So typically, when we were trying to maximize, so, so again, this, this particular exercise was done with uh, a one single channel in the Utah array at a time. These are multi-unit responses uh, from a single channel. We also tried with single unit responses. In general, we observed that if you're maximizing one of the channels, uh, you get uh, a relatively effective stimuli for nearby channels but not necessarily optimal or, or not necessarily better than, than, than the rest. So, so we're focusing on one, and, and because there are correlations in the structure and topography in the structure of the responses in, 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 in cortex, uh, uh, these are not bad stimuli, for, but, but they're not best either. Yeah. Yes? Um, in terms of understanding the results, I guess in the neural network setting, the ways are fixed. So I guess I'm trying to find out the correct input units to activate to get within the fixed architecture to get the maximum activi activation. But I guess in the brain, because it's dynamic, how should I understand um, what that would that be getting? So, he, he, I, uh, so the, the, there, there are several things you might be uh, alluding to uh, by dynamic. One of them is uh, adaptation. So that, that's one effect that happens over time. Uh, another thing that you may uh, be arguing here is that the the weights between neurons, the, the connectivity between neurons might be changing during the course of our experiment. I don't know if that's, uh, if, if that's true. Uh, in general, uh, if you look at the firing rate responses of a neuron to a particular picture, we get very comparable responses at the beginning of the experiment and the end of the experiment. That's not a mathematical proof that, that nothing changed in the network. But we think that during the course of one experiment, at least during the course of half an hour, one hour, the recordings are sufficiently stable that the average firing rate doesn't change. I'm talking about the average firing rates. Neurons are funny devices. If you look at the trial to, by trial response of a neuron, uh, there's a lot of variability. Uh, so much so that people have argued that the FANO factor, that is the variance in the response over trial divided by the mean, in many cases is close to one. So there's a huge amount of trial to trial variability in response to the, uh, to the same picture. And, and we can talk about why and, and, and what that means. But if you look at the average firing rate at the beginning of the experiment, the end of the experiment, uh, they, they, they're, they're extremely similar. That doesn't mean that the network is not changing. I don't know. One, one way in which it's changing is adaptation, and that we can quantify. Otherwise, uh, we, we don't know. OK. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about recurrent computation. So let, let me, uh, I'm going to skip ahead. And, 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 and uh, uh, I, I showed you a couple of examples. Uh, if, if you look at more examples, uh, then they're here. Um, in, in, in general, uh, I, I think one uh, issue that I'd like to raise here for discussion, uh, and, and I think this follows up on, on, on several of the points that were uh, already made by, by Christoph, is that I think we should revisit our anthropomorphic verbal descriptions of neuronal tuning. So we like to use words to describe neuronal tuning, uh, and I think that's not the right uh, vocabulary. So saying that this is a chair neuron, saying that this is a face neuron, saying that, that this is a, a, an orientation tuned neuron and a curvature neuron and so on, that's not the right vocabulary. So what is the right vocabulary? Uh, uh, we need to build models. We need to build quantitative models. Uh, Jim will have a lot to say about that. Uh, but I, let me just point very quickly that some of the best models that we have today we think are not very good in describing the responses to these pictures that we have evolved. So what we're doing here is uh, taking a, a deep convolutional uh, uh, network. Uh, we use the same natural pictures, so all of those pictures of chairs and faces and houses and whatnot, and we use those to fit uh, the responses uh, at a particular level of the, uh, of the deep convolutional network. So we take one of the layers of the convolutional network and we try to see how well we can predict uh, firing rates. So this is an approach that was championed uh, by Dan Yamnes and, 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 and Jim DiCarlo, showing that you can get uh, very reasonable 
bits of the, of the firing rate responses uh, to those pictures. And, and we're showing that here. Uh, and those are the, the, green, uh, the green points. So the, on the x-axis is the firing rates that we predict using a convolutional neural network. And on the uh, y-axis are the actual uh, firing rates. So, so we, can, we, we, can, we can have a pretty decent uh, predictability of uh, firing rates in response to those pictures by simply doing uh, a, a linear fitting of uh, responses from the model uh, onto, the, on, onto, uh, on, on, onto, on, onto firing rates. Uh, the, for the aficionados, we're doing exactly the same thing that, that the others have done. This is a partial least square regression uh, fit. However, when we look at the responses to our evolved images, to our synthetic images, these are images that are very different from anything that we've used to train this, this mapping, this, this linear fitting. Uh, we see that they depart, uh, these are all the gray points, and they depart quite uh, strongly from, uh, from, from, this, uh, from this linear uh, fit. So we cannot predict the responses to these pictures uh, very well. Uh, arguing that, uh, uh, yes, we need to build computational models. That's a much better way of describing the responses than trying to assign uh, words uh, to describe them. Uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, suggesting that, uh, that we still have a long way to go to improve our computational models to be able to explain the responses to any picture. So here's a whole family of pictures that we just cannot predict very well using this type of, um, this, this type of computational uh, models. Uh, uh, Cope. So if you take, if you, uh, see that you're training and just evaluating on the natural images, which you can see, I assume this is the training of mapping the features of the neuron, right? Uh, so let's say you train on like all images of Apple and then test on all images of cars. You have a drop in your picture. Typically, that's something you might expect. Uh, is this something that is happening here that because you're not training your mapping function with uh, the uh, yes, I, th I think that's a very good point. So, so you're, you're right. So, if you if you if you, if you only uh, learned about apples, uh, um, it, it's going to be hard to extrapolate. So, I would say that that's that's a bug in, in our computational models. I'd like to build models that will extrapolate to any picture in the world without having to train on them. Uh, I, I, I see training as cheating. Uh, if, if you always have to train on those same type of pictures, then we're not really learning much and extrapolating much. So I, I would argue that, uh, that uh, so I, th I think part of that, I think uh, may maybe what's going on, is that we, we did try to uh, include some of the evolved images into our training set, and that improved a little, but not too much. Uh, but, I, but I think that, that that is part of what's going on. And, 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 and you and, and many other people have done these exercises of uh, leaving some whole categories out, for example, and seeing how well these models extrapolate. And, 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 and th these models are pretty decent at extrapolating, but, but certainly not perfect. So you, you do take a hit. Uh, if you've never seen apples, predicting the response to apples is hard. And I think that that's one of the problems why we think that we need better computational models. Uh, in, in my mind, once we have a, a good computational model, it should, be allow, it should allow us to explain the responses to any possible picture in the world. I think we're not there. Yeah. Uh, yes? So, so I think the problem with the computational model, we need a lot of confidence. There are lots of computers that linear mapping with all the trains on the linear mapping trains. So I think the computational model It, it, it's quite possible, yeah, absolutely. So, to, uh, there, there's, I'm just saying this, this, this particular flavor is, doesn't seem to be able to account for these responses. Uh, I'm not saying any, I'm, I'm not trying to argue all the computational models are wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm very fond of them. There's plenty to do with them. Uh, I think, I suspect we can fix this, uh, and, and we're trying to. Uh, it, you may be right, it's in the, in, in the linear mapping part, and, and that's a, a reasonable hypothesis. We tried a couple of things, they didn't work, but, but we, ha we have much more to do. I thought you were saying that that fix is not acceptable to you, that if you can't just then train it on something else and find the best map. I don't, want, I, I don't want to have to train on every single possible picture in the world, uh, because then, uh, right? So I, I want to be able to ensure that we can extrapolate to completely different pictures, right? That, that, that's my measure of, of, of whether uh, of, of success, right? So that, that, that to me, is, uh, I, I think it's a, it's a reasonable goal to have, right? Uh, I, I don't want to say, well, you can only test me with apples, right? If, uh, that, that, that doesn't seem like a, a reasonable so model. Maybe the requirement for the mapping function to be exposed to a certain number of dimensions Space it has to be rich enough. It has to be rich enough uh, in some sense. So you're, you're right. So it has to be. It has to be exposed to a certain number of dimensions. That, that's a uh, topic that we can discuss further. I, I don't know very well how to quantify that, but I share your intuition. If I if I train my linear mapping only with a picture of this pointer. That, that's not going to work, so that's unfair, right? But at, at what point is it? Uh, so I, I want to make sure that we can extrapolate, but, but I do want to have a rich enough dictionary of features that we use for that, uh, for, for that uh, mapping. 
Call it. So there's some analysis. Is there any point at which you're identifying a correspondence between individual units in biological cortex and in your artificial cortex? You're optimizing the image with respect to the artificial neuron, but then you're testing to see whether the optimized image with respect to the artificial neuron actually then increases the performance of the firing rate of the biological neuron. Not, not, not in here. Not, not, that, that's not what we're doing here. So what we're doing here is uh, a mapping between, uh, let's say, an entire layer of, of, of the artificial uh, network and a single neuron. And, and, and that, that's what you're seeing uh, uh, in, this, in, in this example uh, here. Okay? So we're, we're describing the response of a single neuron. It, this is very similar to what uh, many other people have done uh, 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 before. So we're not trying to optimize anything in the, in the, in the artificial network uh, here. Okay? So the, all the optimization, all these evolved images were done based on the real biological neuron. But if you found that sort of relationship where you optimize an image for the artificial neurons, so say you find some correlation between the biological unit and the artificial unit, you optimize for the artificial unit, and that ends up increasing the firing rate. That, that, that's an interesting experiment. We haven't done that. So I, I, th I think it's an interesting idea. Uh, uh, indeed, uh, uh, um, uh, there, there have been people that have been trying to do uh, not, not mapping an entire layer, but mapping one unit of the network onto one biological neuron. And, and, and that seems to work surprisingly well. And we can debate why. And, and, and if you do that, then, then you can do the type of exercise that you're uh, alluding to. We, that, that we haven't done that. But. OK. Um, I just want to point out that there's a beautiful paper that I think Jim will probably talk about, and, and this is work by Puya and Co. and where, where's Puya? Okay, Puya and Co. and many others uh, with a with a different approach with uh, with with similar uh, similar goals. And this is uh, I, th I think everybody should read this. Uh, uh, the idea here is uh, instead of using this uh, evolution uh, uh, approach to try to actually build a computational model of the unit and then use that computational model space to try to generate images according to certain functions such as maximizing firing rates or, 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 or other ideas. I won't have much time to discuss that now. I think that it's, this, this is a very interesting approach. The relationship between these two, these two is also very interesting. Um, OK, let me, uh, I'm, I'm going to accelerate uh, here. Um, OK, let me, I, I want to talk uh, at least briefly about uh, one or two more points along this uh, list. Uh, uh, what I was telling you about is, uh, uh, how do we know what we know? How do we know about what uh, neurons uh, uh, prefer? How do we build models uh, about uh, um, uh, trying to propose uh, uh, foveal objects? And, and again, this will be expanded upon in the next uh, presentation. I, wa I want to give you uh, just a flavor of how we're going about uh, trying to study uh, some of these other visual routines, some of these other computations that we think are essential for uh, visual scene understanding. So I'll talk very briefly about uh, 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 about uh, this, uh, uh, these two, and I'm happy to, to expand on this and, 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 and discuss uh, further. So the, the, the first one uh, is about uh, uh, making inferences, about being able to reason uh, in some uh, very generic word, uh, form of the word reasoning uh, about, uh, about the big picture, to be able to, uh, uh, to, to interpret that. Uh, in this case, uh, from uh, 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 in cases where you have uh, incomplete information in the image. In the visual system, uh, perhaps one of the most uh, 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 basic ways of uh, being in a situation where you have incomplete information is the case of uh, visual uh, occlusion. So that chair over there, for example, I can only see a couple of pixels. It's heavily occluded by, by a lot of people, and yet I know that that's, uh, that, that's a chair. Okay? So how are we able to make uh, inferences to be able to complete patterns from minimal information? So we used, uh, in this case, an experimental paradigm called bubbles. Essentially, it's like looking at the world like this. Okay, so if you have a lot of bubbles, it's relatively easy to uh, recognize what the object is. In this case, this is a tool bus seen with 20 bubbles. If you have only four bubbles, the one at the bottom is, uh, is pretty hard to, to, to recognize. So we can titrate, based on the amount of visibility, we can titrate the difficulty of the visual recognition uh, task. So I'm going to ask, uh, how well can humans recognize objects when they are heavily occluded? Uh, and then I'm going to ask, uh, how well can computational models do this? And what happens uh, inside uh, the brain while uh, subjects are performing pattern completion for uh, heavily occluded uh, uh, objects? 
So let me start with uh, basic psychophysics. This is uh, behavioral data in, uh, in, in, in human subjects. What you're seeing here is performance as a function of the amount of uh, visibility in the, in, the, in the objects. So if the object is fully visible, this is a very simple task. Subjects were performing a five-way categorization task, uh, uh, and, 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 and the people are essentially at ceiling. That's the point that you see there on the, uh, uh, on the upper right. And you start uh, reducing the amount of uh, visibility, the task becomes harder and harder, chance is 20%. Uh, uh, but what's quite remarkable here is that uh, subjects are quite robust, uh, and they are uh, uh, at about 60 or, or, or more, 60% or, or, or better performance, even up to 10% visibility. So you have only a very small fraction of the object is visible, and yet subjects can recognize uh, uh, very well. The colors are not too relevant here. They will become relevant very soon. The colors here represent the amount of exposure of the picture for how long the picture was on the, uh, on the screen, OK? Um, OK, let me skip this. Um, so let me now show you uh, what happens uh, when we use uh, a technique that's called uh, backward masking. Backward masking involves presenting a picture and then very briefly after showing that picture, uh, introducing a noise pattern. Uh, this is, uh, uh, has been purported to interrupt processing uh, in the visual system uh, in such a way that people have claimed that this is a way of studying largely, but probably not perfectly, the uh, bottom-up pathway without the intervention of the interaction between uh, incoming signals and feedback uh, signals. So the idea is that you present a picture. Uh, after a few uh, milliseconds, uh, you show some of these uh, mask uh, uh, noise uh, patterns. Uh, and the, uh, the argument is that because you're interrupting processing with this, uh, with this noise uh, uh, um, with this noise image, uh, you basically interrupt the interaction between the incoming visual signals uh, and any potential uh, feedback uh, signals. I have to confess that I'm not completely convinced that this is true. Uh, we can debate about the mechanisms of what's actually happening during backward masking. And I suspect that they are far more complicated than the short story I just uh, uh, alluded to. But at least to a first approximation, uh, it's clear in lots of behavioral psychophysics experiments going, down, uh, going, going back to uh, uh, almost a century that backward masking can severely disrupt uh, visual uh, processing. And I'm going to show you uh, uh, behavioral evidence that that's uh, the case. So here's the same exact experiment, except that briefly after showing the picture, uh, we introduce this uh, backward mask. So the backward mask is introduced either 25 milliseconds, 50 milliseconds, all the way to 150 milliseconds after the onset of the picture. That's what the different colors uh, represent. So if you have a lot of processing time, if you have about 150 milliseconds uh, of processing of the image, uh, basically nothing happens. That is, the backward mask, uh, the performance under the backward mask conditions are essentially identical to the ones that I showed you uh, before without uh, masking. However, uh, particularly in the 25 millisecond condition, but also in some of the other conditions, when you have a very brief exposure to the, to, to the image, backward masking severely disrupts uh, visual recognition uh, performance. To the extent that backward masking is indeed interrupting uh, some sort of feedback uh, computation, uh, we argue that uh, this backward mask is uh, uh, pointing to the notion that we need additional computations in order to be able to perform this uh, visual pattern uh, completion uh, task. Uh, okay, so that's, uh, uh, that, that's behavior. So now let me very give you a very quick glimpse of what happens now in the human brain when subjects are doing this uh, visual recognition uh, task with, uh, um, uh, with heavily occluded uh, uh, images. So the way, the, word, uh, the way that we can record activity in the human brain, as I already mentioned uh, earlier, and Christoph also mentioned uh, uh, in, in, in one of his uh, talks, is by virtue of working with patients that have pharmacological intractable epilepsy. Uh, because the, none of the known drugs work with these patients, what the neurosurgeons end up doing is inserting electrodes inside uh, the brain in order to map uh, where the seizures are coming from, and in order to also map functionally uh, different parts of, uh, of of the brain to try to resect the parts that are responsible for seizures and try to remove them. So the removal of epileptogenic focus is one of the uh, main ways of treating this type of pharmacologically resistant uh, epilepsy. Uh, 
So we have a patient that's about uh, that's staying in the hospital for about one week with electrodes implanted. I showed you earlier one example of the very few cases when we can record action potentials from the human brain. This is the case that I'm showing now where we're recording intracranial field potential signals. So what are these field potential signals? Well, nobody really knows. Uh, there's some sort of conglomerate activity of a large number of uh, neurons in the vicinity of the electrode. They probably span uh, on the order of two to five millimeters of, uh, of computation. We have millisecond resolution, high signal to noise ratio, but we don't have uh, the, the, the ability to uh, identify individual neurons here. So what you're seeing here is an intracranial field potential uh, response. Uh, uh, to this picture, there are 39 repetitions. Uh, the x-axis is uh, time. Um, the uh, dashed line it corresponds to the onset of the picture. And you can see that we can get highly reproducible responses uh, uh, to this picture. The gray lines are the individual trials. The, gr the, the green is the, the average of those uh, 39 uh, responses. So what happens now if we show some of these uh, heavily occluded uh, uh, images? So these are four examples, it's four single trials of uh, uh, heavily occluded images. And you can see that the responses, uh, there's a considerable amount of variability from one response to the next, but w uh, to the next, but we can still elicit visually selective responses despite the fact that these are, uh, these are cases where uh, the subject only saw about 10 to 15% of, uh, of the picture. The numbers shown there are the times in milliseconds of the peak of the response. So you can see that the peak of the response in the uh, fully visible picture was 150 milliseconds. In the other cases, all the response peaks were larger. Uh, a skeptic scientist, you can ask whether I'm just uh, selecting a couple of uh, trials. So let me just show you uh, uh, more trials. So these are all the responses that we got for a single electrode in this particular patient in this particular uh, session. And what I'm showing you uh, in this case are uh, all the responses to five different pictures of uh, faces. And you can see a pretty consistent uh, response. The color corresponds to the intracranial field potential. The scale is shown up there. So sometime before uh, 200 milliseconds, there is a negative voltage that's similar to what was uh, shown here. So it's a negative voltage starting somewhere uh, before 200 milliseconds, followed by uh, a positive voltage, uh, that's the red line, somewhere uh, after 200 milliseconds. So this is very consistent across uh, uh, trials. As a matter of fact, in some sense that are still hard to quantify, these are much more consistent than the responses of individual neurons that I alluded to uh, uh, earlier. So what happens when we present the partial or uh, uh, partially visible uh, images? Uh, we still have selective responses. We still see those blue and red traces. They look uh, uh, poorly aligned in this case because every picture is different. The position of those bubbles are random. So, so that's why we get a lot of uh, variability. If we fix the position of the bubbles, uh, we get uh, uh, a little bit more consistent, not as m consistent as the fully visible uh, uh, responses. But interestingly, all the physiological responses that we obtain in response to the partially occluded images are significantly delayed with respect to the fully visible ones. In other words, at the physiological level now, it costs about 50 milliseconds. It takes about 50 milliseconds extra to be able to make this type of uh, visual inference. So coupling the behavioral results with the backward masking experiment with the physiological responses, we conjecture that we need additional computations. We need a little bit more time. We need a few extra milliseconds to be able to do pattern inference, to be able to recognize objects that are uh, heavily occluded. Indeed, if you show exactly the same images to your favorite uh, 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 deep convolutional neural network, uh, we find that we get relatively poor uh, uh, ability to recognize uh, those uh, images. So this is the same format as before, performance as a function of the amount of visibility. Uh, each color here corresponds to a different uh, uh, layer or a different uh, 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 deep convolutional network uh, uh, architecture. And essentially, all of these networks would perform uh, uh, extremely well uh, if you had fully visible uh, uh, objects. Uh, but when you have a very heavy occlusion, um, uh, human performance is uh, uh, significantly better than any of these uh, networks. Uh, for the aficionados, these are networks that are pre-trained on, uh, on ImageNet. We're not doing any fine tuning, any training at all with our pictures. We don't want to train with our pictures. We want to be able to extrapolate and, 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 and move from uh, training with completely different pictures. So we, uh, uh, 
Based on the behavior, based on the physiology, we conjecture that the addition of recurrent computations, that is the, the, uh, the addition of additional computational steps, would be uh, useful to be able to do pattern uh, completion. And we implemented this in an extremely simple way. We took, uh, uh, in this case, uh, AlexNet. We did this also for many other networks. We took the top level of one of these uh, computational architectures, and we added horizontal connections uh, between all possible uh, units in that uh, network. Those units were uh, uh, trained uh, using what we call a Hopfield attractor uh, network, meaning that these computational units have symmetric weights. And uh, those weights were dictated purely by the fully visible objects. So we're never training uh, our system with the partially visible, uh, uh, with the partially, partially visible uh, uh, images. And that's the, the network that we refer to as RNNH. And we see that that already uh, gave us uh, a small but quite significant boost in performance without any free parameters. There are zero free parameters. There are zero knobs here. We're not tweaking, training, learning anything here. Uh, just by adding horizontal connections in a single layer of, uh, of AlexNet, uh, we can get uh, better performance. And then if we play the games that many people like to play with training networks, that's the version that we called RNN5, where we allow ourselves to train the network work with those uh, occluded uh, uh, images, uh, of course, always using uh, cross-validation. And in that case, we can match human performance just by adding this uh, recurrent uh, uh, connectivity in the, uh, uh, in the network. Um, OK. Let me, uh, are there any questions about this? Yes? What uh, layer did you select for that? And is there any kind of, uh, for like what kind of motivated so everything that's shown here is with the FC7 layer, if that tells you anything. So uh, OK, so uh, AlexNet has uh, uh, eight layers. FC stands for fully connected, uh, and the seven stands for layer seven. Uh, the next layer, which is called FC8, is the classification layer. So that's trained on ImageNet, for example, to categorize a 1,000 things. So there are 1,000 units in FC8. Uh, one is the honeycomb unit, the other one is the chair unit, uh, uh, and, and so on. So this is just one layer before that. We actually used, uh, uh, if, if you look at the, um, at the figures and supplements, uh, uh, we, we, we looked at many different uh, uh, layers and, 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 and many different options, many different architectures as well. I'm just showing you one example of that uh, in here. There's variation between layers, between different architectures. Uh, trust me, I'm a scientist, as Christoph said. Uh, the, the basic conclusions, I think, are independent of whether you choose ResNet or AlexNet. On, uh, and they, they are somewhat dependent on, on the layer. Uh, uh, but ultimately, I think this is just a, a proof of principle toy example. Uh, what we really probably should be doing here is adding horizontal connections, for example, in every possible layer, which is the biologically more relevant uh, way of doing this. Incidentally, Ko, who's sitting right uh, behind you, has, uh, I think, a beautiful story that came out recently in Nature Neuroscience, uh, which I think is very related to this, where they've shown that adding, uh, uh, essentially, uh, recurrent computations uh, throughout the, all, all, all the different layers in, in, in these networks can help not only in, in, in the conditions of visual occlusion. This is just one example of many other kinds of uh, hard visual recognition problems, where, essentially, all kinds of uh, visual recognition scenarios where, uh, uh, where where uh, feedforward networks uh, uh, fail, uh, where you can add these recurrent connections and train them and, and get much better performance. We tested the model. That the model was actually developed by the uh, Okay, sorry, sorry. I, I, okay, so, okay. So, 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 Ko and 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 Martin and 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 who else? And Jonas. And Jonas. Okay, Jonas. Okay, uh, all right. Uh, yes, Adam. Uh, of the ones shown in here, uh, yes. I mean, we can debate about how humans are trained and, 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 and how humans, but yes. No, I'm just uh, wondering if, the, if it's uh, related to the horizontal connections. Have you tried training another uh, network that doesn't have the horizontal connection um, with the images and see what happens? I indeed. So uh, th th that's a very good point. So uh, here, here's one thing. Uh, let me see if I have a picture of that. Yeah, so in, in some sense, there's nothing completely magical about recurrent connections. As, in, as a matter of fact, uh, you can do uh, what people call unfolding. You can take a network that has horizontal connections, and you can actually convert that network into a purely feed-forward one 
by doing what people call uh, weight sharing. So I just take that, uh, that, that network over there, and I just in inject multiple additional feedforward layers with the same weights. Uh, so that tells you that there, at, at least uh, there's a proof of existence that there has to be a feedforward network that can do exactly the same type of uh, computation. As you pointed out, we can take a feedforward network, we can train it with the occluded objects, and we can actually get similar performance uh, as well. Why do we care about recurrent computations? So uh, I, uh, I'd like to argue uh, uh, for recurrent computations for uh, uh, a couple of reasons. So one of them may be less interested mm, to you and to uh, other people, which is uh, the sheer uh, economy of uh, how many units you have uh, and how many ways you need to train. So networks that have horizontal connections are much more economical uh, in the sense of uh, uh, how, how much energy you, s you spend, how much uh, and the size of the brain, how many units uh, you need, how many synapses you need, and, and so on. So there may be a lot of energetic considerations why it may be preferable to use uh, uh, horizontal connections as opposed to uh, keep expanding enormous uh, feed-forward networks. Now, th th that, that may not be super interesting. If you are Mr. Google, you have infinite uh, uh, power, you don't care about the environment, uh, you, can, uh, you, you can keep making a a enormous uh, 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 networks, and, and, and you don't care about saving uh, uh, units, perhaps. That, that, that's a fair point. So I'd like to make uh, another argument, which I think is interesting, about uh, doing things that way. Uh, and that has to do with the flexibility of the computations uh, that, that you can make. If you have a purely feed-forward structure and you, um, uh, and, 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 and you train that type of structure for a particular task, you're stuck with that architecture, okay? Uh, whereas in this case, you can flexibly route information uh, and do as many computations as needed on a per-case basis depending on the task demand. So there may be certain pictures that are very easy to recognize. Uh, for example, the fully visible pictures that I showed. Okay? In which case, you don't need to worry about all of those recurrent loops. Maybe you can just go through the entire system uh, at, at very, very, very fast, and you can solve that problem, let's say, in 100, 150 milliseconds. And that's what the physiology sort of uh, alluded to. That's what the backward masking experiments also alluded to. Uh, but if you have a more complex task, maybe you need to ruminate and, 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 and you need more additional computations. And the same, the same architecture without any retraining, without anything, can flexibly be used uh, to, to solve the problem one way uh, or the other. Uh, whereas the, the feed-forward version, uh, you're stuck. In, at least in this version, uh, you're stuck with that architecture. You always have to go uh, through all the layers in order to solve that problem. An alternative way to solve the problem computationally, and this has been uh, um, um, used in, uh, in certain architectures such as ResNet is to have what the people call bypass connections. Okay? So in principle, there's no reason why you cannot, in this diagram, you could connect layer I minus one directly to layer I plus one uh, without, by bypassing all of the intervening ones. Right? Uh, as a matter of fact, you can create a, 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 a network with 100 layers and connect them all to all if you wanted to. Okay? But then I would argue that, that, that they were starting to resemble that, uh, that kind of uh, uh, scenario. Actually, what, what is, uh, I think is interesting here is actually that the first claim um, can be trained and networked with the same amount of parameters just without the connections because it is possible that there is some memorization inside the network and the horizontal connections are not even being used. Yeah, right. So if, if, you, if you train uh, networks uh, with the same uh, uh, with, with the same number, so the, the number of parameters is actually smaller in the in, in, in the recurrent uh, network uh, in, in in this case. Um, uh, if you train uh, if you if you train AlexNet uh, with uh, fewer weights or the same number of weights as with the with, with the recurrent case, which I think that's that that's what you're asking, uh, you get slightly worse performance, uh, but but you still get a, a pretty significant boost. Uh, as long as you're training with those occluded uh, objects, okay? So here the argument, uh, so, so to, um, to look deeper into this question, we did another experiment. I was not planning to show that, uh, which has to do with the following. We, we used completely novel objects that humans had never seen before and showed that humans can actually recognize occluded objects just from one instance of recognition of, that, uh, of, those, uh, uh, of those objects as well. So again, uh, I'm a bit skeptical that in order to recognize an occluded chair, you need to have seen occluded chairs before. Okay? So all this business of training with occluded uh, images uh, 
seems, uh, in principle at least, uh, 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 strange uh, to me in that uh, you need to have training with, with specifically the, that same class of objects in an occluded uh, version. But, but if you want to, uh, uh, you can actually get uh, very good performance if you, if, if you, if you train. Uh, partly, I think, because uh, these networks have so many free parameters that uh, e even if you have a heavy occlusion with the number of categories that we use, uh, you, you're, still, um, uh, you're still able to solve that. As another point to this, uh, that kind of approach still breaks down again when we expand enormously the number of categories. The kind of exercises that we play with here are, are pretty small by computer vision standards. Uh, I didn't quite uh, go into the details, but we have five categories and, and, and five pictures per category, so 25 pictures. By computer vision standards, this is very small. Now, if you take ImageNet and you include all the pictures in ImageNet, uh, then you run very quickly into trouble if you're trying to train the purely feedforward uh, network. So you can solve this small problem in that way with this very artifactual version of training with the same kind of, of pictures when they are included. So when you're using like the main scene, is there a current computation or is it like the hope is very good because this was designed to do that kind of project in memory and faster and like recall and so, so perhaps a, a way to check that would be so you can have a big forward validation of hope when you expand for example oh, and you do all the it, it, indeed, we, we, we chose the Hopfield Attractor Network because we knew uh, you can mathematically show that a Hopfield Attractor Network can do error correction. Right. Uh, so so uh, it, it was not a, uh, a, a, perhaps I should have uh, been more clear about that. We, we didn't choose randomly uh, a Hopfield Network. Uh, we, we know that we can mathematically show that under some conditions, if the weights are symmetric and whatnot, that has to converge uh, to, the, to the representation of the whole object. I, I am not sure what you mean by I, I, at least I have to think a bit more, and, and, and you can uh, show me later, how can I build a feed-forward network with an attractor-based uh, 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 Hopfield rule? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how to do that. Maybe, uh, uh, that, that sounds a bit strange to me, but, but, but maybe you have a way. To, I, I agree that if you have a way to do that, 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 would, that would be an interesting comparison. Um, yeah. I, I don't think there's anything magical about the Hopfield rule. What I like about it is that we have zero free parameters. We don't have to do any training, and, 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 and it works. Uh, but as I showed, uh, you can also inject horizontal connections, train them, and, and, and get similar results. And then you don't get the attractor that happens. And then if you look at the actual, uh, and, and then if you actually look at the weights, uh, it, first of all, they're not symmetric. Uh, uh, mm, uh, and, and, and second, uh, it, it was very unclear to us that there's any kind of attractor-based dynamics in those, in, in those networks. Where, uh, that, yeah. Yes? I have a big picture question. Um, so what's sense do you think of how much of the network you're working on are really the helping us solve the Uh, I, I, think, I think it's a fair question. Uh, I, I, I have to confess I'm uh, s extremely far from being able to understand Obama's picture. Uh, uh, I'm arguing uh, and I'm postulating, if you will, that there are certain routines that we need in order to do visual understanding. And we're studying each one of those steps uh, uh, independently. Uh, I have a, 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 an almost uh, uh, the, 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 the intuition or, or, or the, the, the working hypothesis here is that uh, as we get better and better at, at solving all of these tasks that we know happen in the brain and that they, they, they have too much uh, physiology and behavior, that ultimately we're going in the, in the right direction. Uh, but you're absolutely right. I, I, I'm not telling you, uh, I, I use that mostly as a, uh, as, as a motivation. I won't tell you anything about how uh, people think about their weight or, 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 or how people understand humor. Uh, I, I actually, uh, in one of the previous summer courses, I proposed this as a, as a, as a, as a project. Uh, I have lots of uh, graphical humor pictures. Uh, I think that's an impossible project. I, I, I don't think that there's any chance right now that, that we can get a system to that. And, and I, I won't, uh, th this, these are very, very, very tiny steps in, in, uh, to, towards that. And, and, and I'm happy to, to, to discuss more about um, how, we, how we're going to get there. Any, any, any other questions? Uh, okay. Uh, I'm just going to give the title of uh, the, the other thing that I wanted to mention, uh, just in case uh, anyone is interested in these kind of issues. Uh, I'm going to skip most of the slides uh, uh, here uh, just to, to conclude very quickly. Um, 
the other topic that I wanted to mention briefly has to do with uh, uh, eye movements. Uh, and the reason I wanted to bring eye movements is because I think this is one of the next things that, that happen uh, after you, uh, in, 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 when, when you're understanding a scene, uh, very quickly you have a glimpse of what's happening within, uh, let's say, some uh, uh, radius around, uh, uh, around your center of uh, fixation. And, and very quickly you're moving your eyes uh, uh, in, 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 in the image. Uh, it takes about uh, somewhere between two and 300 milliseconds for the first saccade, for the first eye movement uh, under, un under most of these uh, natural conditions. So, we spend quite, uh, uh, so, so we've been spending quite some time trying to understand and computationally model the mechanisms that dictate where you're going to move your eyes and how you're going to move your eyes uh, uh, within, within a scene, which again, we think that's a, a very tiny component uh, uh, with the long term of uh, being able to understand these, uh, these type of scenes. So uh, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip that. I just wanted to mention that we did a visual search task. Uh, and, um, and, and just flash this picture very quickly. Uh, if you're interested uh, in, uh, in, in eye movements, uh, as uh, one of the next steps uh, to, to our strain to understand uh, and integrate different parts of an image uh, and, 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 and what happens when you're uh, doing uh, image uh, understanding. You can scan that, uh, uh, um, uh, that QR code over there. You can download the code. You can download the data, the data uh, and, and, and see uh, the, the primitive initial steps that we have made uh, towards trying to predict, uh, in this case, how humans will move their eyes while they're doing a visual search uh, uh, task. Uh, so I'm not going to say much more about this. If anyone is interested in, in visual search, come talk to me. Um, and I think I'll just uh, stop there. And uh, if there are any other questions, I'll, I'll take them.